There are three stages of aerobic ATP production, and we've already talked about this when we talked about um, carbohydrate and glucose. The first stage is to generate acetyl-CoA. And the way we do that, if we start with glucose, is that we go through glycolysis. At the end of glycolysis, we end up with 2-pyruvate. Okay, the pyruvates go into the intermediate step, and out of the intermediate step, we get acetyl-CoA. Okay. Once you have acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA can go into Krebs cycle, which is uh, the second stage. And then the third stage is that all the NADH plus H plus and all the FADH2s that were um, created along the way go on to the electron transport chain. So what we're going to talk about in this recording is how these are different with fat. And it's actually just a slight difference. Really, the only difference when we're producing ATP from fat is the way that we generate acetyl-CoA. Okay? So we're going to talk about beta-oxidation. Uh, and through beta-oxidation, we will create acetyl-CoA. Okay? And just like with um, acetyl-CoA that comes from glucose, that acetyl-CoA will go to Krebs, and we will have some NADH plus H plus and FADH2s that go to electron transport chains. So there's a lot of overlap um, with fat and carbohydrate. So beta oxidation is the oxidation of fat to create acetyl-CoA. So it's that first step in aerobic ATP production. And the location of beta oxidation is within the mitochondria. Okay, it is an aerobic oxidative process. Uh, the function of beta oxidation is to make ATP from fat. Okay. And um, earlier in this chapter, I told you that the usable form, okay, the form of fat that we use to make ATP is FFA. Uh, and now, before we go on, I need to say a little bit more about FFA. So, the structure of FFA is that it is a long chain of carbon atoms that are arranged in pairs. And the two most common FFA molecules that we use to make ATP are 16 carbon and 18 carbon chains. So, for this presentation, for this recording, we are going to use a 16 carbon FFA as the example. And so what you can see here is that we have a total of 16 carbons arranged in pairs. Okay, so we have eight pair. We have a total of 16 carbons. Okay. Uh, this FFA is called palmitic acid. If you look at its chemical um, formula, you can see there's 16 carbons, okay, 16 carbons arranged in pairs, and so there are eight pair. All right, remember that we store fat as triglyceride. Okay, a triglyceride consists of a glycerol, backbone, and three fatty acids. So before we can go into beta oxidation, we need to release these fatty acids because the usable form is the fatty acids. So when triglyceride breaks down, it breaks down into glycerol and three free fatty acids. Free because they're not bound to glycerol anymore. And each of those FFAs can then go on to beta oxidation to give us ATP. Okay. The lipolysis, however, does not occur in the mitochondria it occurs in the cytoplasm. 
Okay, this is not aerobic ATP production. This is a preparatory step for aerobic ATP production. So this lipolysis process occurs in the cytoplasm, and then the FFAs are released and eventually go into the mitochondria. And that's where beta oxidation occurs. You might be wondering what happens to glycerol. Uh, there's actually a few things that can happen to glycerol, um, but one of them is that the glycerol can then leave the cell, go to the liver, and in the liver it can go through the process of gluconeogenesis and it can get converted into glucose. Okay, so we've talked about gluconeogenesis a few times. We've talked about lactic acid being converted to glucose. We call that the Cori cycle. We've talked about protein being converted to glucose. We call that the alanine cycle because it uses the amino acid alanine. And now we see that you can take fat and convert it to glucose. Um, gluconeogenesis always occurs in the liver. Uh, and once that glucose is created in the liver, it can either be stored away as liver glycogen or it can be released back into the bloodstream and used as fuel somewhere else. All right, so we have, we're here in the cytoplasm. Here's our mitochondrial membrane. Okay, we just went through lipolysis. Okay, we released free fatty acids. Okay, and now we're going to trace what happens to the free fatty acids. Okay, um, from one triglyceride, you're going to release three free fatty acids, uh, but we're only going to trace one free fatty acid. So you understand what happens once, and then you understand that for every triglyceride molecule, uh, this whole process happens three times because there are three FFAs. So we have our FFA, and the first thing that happens, and again, we're still in the cytoplasm, is something called the activation step. Okay. In the activation step, we invest, we use two ATP. Okay. So we're using ATP in the early stages, just like we did um, in the early stages of glycolysis, we had to use and invest some ATP before we produced it. So once FFA is activated, it is now in the activated form, and now it enters the mitochondria. Okay, So it's going to cross over the mitochondrial membrane, it's going to go into the mitochondria, and it's going to enter the process of beta oxidation. So FFA, this activated FFA goes through a series of reactions, okay, and the, the details of those reactions aren't really important. Uh, what I want to focus on is what happens along the way that is going to contribute to ATP production, okay. So we have this activated FFA. Remember that we have a 16 carbon, okay, so we have eight pairs. In the first step of beta oxidation, this activated FFA releases two hydrogens, two electrons, which are picked up by FAD, and therefore the activated FFA becomes oxidized. Oxidation is losing electrons. FAD becomes reduced. Reduction is gaining electrons, and we end up with an FAD. That FAD is then, then going to go off to the electron transport chain, and a res, as a result, we're going to get 1.5 ATP. Okay? You can go back and review the electron transport chain in your notes to see why we get that 1.5. The next step, we this... Um, Activated FFA releases another pair of hydrogens and electrons, and therefore, and, and this time, 
they're picked up by NAD instead of FAD, and we end up with NADH plus H plus. So again, the activated FFA was oxidized, NAD was reduced. This NADH plus H plus is going to go off to the electron transport chain, and as a result, we're going to get 2.5 ATP. Okay. Um, we get one more ATP from NADH plus H plus than we do from FADH2. And again, if you go back to the electron transport chain, it's because FAD enters the electron transport chain at a later step. And so we lose that. Uh, we don't really lose it, but we never get that first ATP. All right, so what happens next? So again, this activated FFA is still traveling and going through the processes. And now at this point, one of the carbon pairs breaks off. Okay, So one of the carbon pairs breaks off and becomes acetyl-CoA. And now that acetyl-CoA can go to the Krebs cycle. What we're left with is your activated fatty, free fatty acid with one less carbon pair. Okay, so we started with okay, so it's a 16 carbon. We started with eight pairs, okay? And what happened in this process of beta oxidation is that one of these pairs was broken off. Okay, so this bond was broken and that carbon pair goes off to become acetyl-CoA and then go through Krebs cycle. So what we're left with is that activated FFA right here with one less carbon pair. Okay, so now instead of eight pairs we have seven pairs. And that FFA, that activated FFA, is going to continue to go through beta oxidation until all of the pairs are broken off. Okay? And one way to think of it is every time you go through beta oxidation, you break one of these bonds. Okay? And we need to break all these bonds in order to release all the carbon pairs in order to make acetyl-CoA, which can then go to Krebs cycle and give us ATP. So in order to break all of these pairs, we're going to need to go through beta oxidation seven times. Okay? Because each time we go through, we break a bond. So first time, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Okay? So after we break that seventh bond, that eighth pair does not have to go through again because it's already a carbon pair by itself. Okay, So in order to completely divide this 16 carbon FFA into eight individual pairs, we need to go through beta oxidation seven times. So everything you see here happens seven times. We get seven FADH2s, we get seven NADH plus H plus, we get eight carbon pairs, okay? And therefore we get eight acetyl-CoA's, and therefore we're going to now go through Krebs cycle eight times, okay? Remember that the reason why we have eight here is because when that seventh pair breaks off the seventh time around, that eighth pair doesn't need to go around. Okay? That eighth carbon pair can just follow the seventh carbon pair and become acetyl-CoA um, because we don't have any more bonds to break. Okay? And from this you can easily calculate how much ATP we're going to get. Right? So in the beginning we invest two okay? Then we have um, seven FADH plus H's that go off to electron transport chain. Each one is going to give us one and a half ATPs. 
7 times 1.5 is going to give us 10.5 um, ATPs from this. We also have 7 NADH plus Hs, which each give us 2.5. Okay, 7 times 2.5 equals 17.5. So we get a total of 28 ATP as a result of the FADs and the NADs coming out of beta oxidation. But remember, you need to subtract the two that we got in activation. So now we have a net gain of 26 ATPs. But we have a lot more ATP coming because we also have to count for the eight acetyl-CoA's that were created. Okay, so now what we need to do is review what happens when we go through Krebs cycle because we're going to go through Krebs cycle eight times and we have to calculate how many ATP we're going to get from that. So we're going to go through eight times. Remember that if we started from glucose We end up with two pyruvates, and therefore we go through Krebs twice. But we're not talking about glucose, okay? We're talking about a 16 carbon FFA, which produces eight acetyl CoA. So we're going to do this process eight times. Okay, let's review what happens one time through. All right, so we get an NADH plus H plus. We get a second one. We get a third. Okay, so we get three NADH plus H plus. Okay, each time through, we get one FADH2. and we get one ATP. But we're going to go through eight times, so we have to multiply each of these by eight. Okay. And remember that NAD gives us 2.5 ATP, so three times eight times 2.5 gives us 60. FAD, each FAD gives us 1.5 ATP. So 1 times 8 times 1.5 is 12. Okay. And then we get 1 times 8 ATP. So now we get 8. Okay, so now we're getting 80 ATP. So we've got 80. We have to add that to what we got from oxidation, uh, uh, from the oxidation within beta oxidation. So, um, so we've gone through the activation step. We used two. We've gone through beta oxidation, and we produced 28. Okay, now we've gone through Krebs, and we've produced 80. Okay. So our net gain is 106 ATP. Okay. So you should be able to draw all of these processes and also go back and trace where the ATP comes from. So when we have um, a 16 carbon FFA, we're going to go through the activation step once. We're going to go through beta oxidation seven times because we have seven bonds to break. We're going to go through Krebs eight times 
because we have eight carbon pairs which create eight acetyl-CoA. If we have an 18 carbon FFA, it's just slightly different. Okay? We still go through the activation step once, but now we're going to go through beta oxidation eight times because if you have nine pair, you have eight bonds to break instead of seven bonds to break. So you're going to go through eight times and nine pair are going to turn into nine carbon pairs which are going to turn into nine acetyl coas so we're going to go through Krebs nine times and if you go back through and do all of your math um, for 18 carbon you'll see that you get a total of 120 ATP so I'm not going to go through that because at this point you should be able to trace through that yourself and figure out where 120 came from